All right, it looks like we have reached our start time. So uh, welcome to everybody who has, has joined so far. Um, we are coming to you from the National Collaborating Center for Methods and Tools, uh, which is located within the traditional territories of the Mississauga and Haudenosaunee Nations, and within the lands protected by the Dish with One Spoon Wampum Agreement. Uh, we're very excited today to present to you our uh, rapid review methodology that we have adapted for the COVID-19 pandemic response. There we go. Um, there are just a few housekeeping items before we start the, the webinar content. Um, we, we are using a new webinar platform, uh, so please let us know. You can reach out to an attendee labeled National Collaborating Center for Methods and Tools. Um, and we have Isabel behind that line and she'll be able to help you out with any tech questions that you have. Uh, we do recommend using a wired internet connection um, if possible. Um, and if possible, if you are having any issues, uh, we do recommend using the latest version of Google Chrome or Firefox. Um, please, again, don't hesitate to send out a private message to our administrator at uh, the NCCMT. Um, if you do have any questions for the presenters throughout the webinar, uh, you can uh, type those into the public chat and we'll make sure we address those at the end of the webinar. We will also have a few polling questions today throughout the webinar. Uh, when those are open and active, uh, they'll pop up over the slide. Uh, there may be a very slight delay when the poll po uh, polling questions actually pop up. But once you enter your response, make sure that you hit submit so that your response gets recorded. You can also select to answer the question later and it will enter your queue to be completed at any time uh, during the webinar. Uh, after today, uh, you'll be able to access the recording um, in English at our YouTube channel. Um, and the slides will be provided in both English and French. A uh, great place to, to keep an eye out is our Twitter, at uh, NCCMT. Um, and we will post on there when the recording and slides are available. So we'll jump into our first polling question for today. Um, this question always feels a little bit off during the pandemic, but uh, we, we wanted to know how many people are joining the session today with you on your connection, um, whether you are uh, attending on your own, whether you're in a small group or even a larger group attending. We know some people have returned uh, to the office. Um, so we are just wondering uh, how many people are attending uh, in groups today. Uh, looks like most of our attendees are attending alone, although we do have a couple of small groups and that's really great as well. Moving on to the next question. Um, we're interested in how familiar you are with the National Collaborating Center for Methods and Tools um, and our website and resources. Um, so there's an option on the screen for um, if you have not used our resources before. Um, and some options for if you have used the resources before, how often you have uh, used those. Um, so that should be opening up. Um, Isabel, you can go ahead and open that one. Perfect. And the question for how many times you have used it will pop up in the next uh, pop up as well. So it looks like we have quite a few people who are familiar uh, with our resources, which is really fantastic to see. We're glad to see you back. And for those of you who are maybe less familiar with what we have to offer, we hope that this is a very useful introduction to you to some of our work, um, and we hope to see you uh, return more often. That's great. Uh, so a very, very brief overview of the National Collaborating Centers. Um, we are actually one of six National Collaborating Centers across Canada. Uh, we are hosted at McMaster University in Hamilton, Ontario. Our goal specifically is to support public health professionals and organizations in integrating evidence-informed decision-making into their work. Um, all of the six National Collaborating Centers are funded by the Public Health Agency of Canada. Um, and we each focus on a different priority public health topic area. Um, so starting out west, uh, the National Collaborating Center for Indigenous Health is in Prince George, BC. Uh, the National Collaborating Center for Environmental Health is in Vancouver. The NCC for Infectious Diseases is in Winnipeg, Manitoba. 
Um, the NCC for Healthy Public Policy is in Montreal, Quebec. And finally, the NCC for Determinants of Health is out in Antigonish, Nova Scotia. I did see we had one person shouting out from Nova Scotia, so that's great to see. In terms of what we do have to offer, um, we do have many products and services that can support public health professionals with your evidence-informed decision-making. Um, this includes a registry of methods and tools with over 270 methods and tools. Uh, we have online learning opportunities that include our online uh, learning modules. Um, we host workshops, which are now being done uh, virtually. Um, public Health Plus is a repository of public health research. Uh, research findings. Um, we have a couple of different video series, including our, our very popular understanding research evidence videos, uh, which go through different concepts um, in really short and easy to understand uh, videos. Um, and we also engage in quite a bit of networking and outreach. So I'm very excited today to introduce our speakers for today. Um, Dr. Sarah Neil Stramko is a Knowledge Translation Advisor at the National Collaborating Center for Methods and Tools, um, and Dr. Maureen Dobbins, who is our Scientific Director. Um, so I will now hand it over to Sarah and Maureen. Uh, looking forward to hearing from you both. Thanks so much, uh, Emily. So I'm Maureen Dobbins, and I will just take us through the first little bit uh, of our webinar today to just talk a bit about um, how we ended up in this space of uh, doing rapid reviews during uh, COVID. But just before uh, we get there, hopefully uh, this is not new to many of you, but just, um, just if it is, we really are focused our center on uh, how to support evidence-informed decision making and a uh, definition that you're that you may be familiar with is it's a process of distilling and disseminating the best available evidence from research context and experience and then using that evidence to inform and improve public health practice programs and policy and so that's the diagram on the left hand side there we're certainly uh, very much working within the paradigm that decision making in public health is very complex. It's made up of many different kinds of evidence. Uh, the science or research evidence is just one component of that, which is the bubble in the bottom left, but also made up of uh, uh, the local context, epidemiological data, for example. It's also uh, the societal and political preferences, as well as the resources. And that expertise is the bubble in the middle that is involved in bringing all of that evidence together to make the best decisions in collaboration with other um, uh, audiences and decision makers at the jurisdictional level. And um, the uh, image to the right is uh, a process of uh, evidence-informed decision-making that guide specific steps. And so um, the circular pattern of defining questions, searching for evidence, appraising the quality of the evidence, figuring out how to bring it all together in terms of synthesis, thinking about how it may need to be adapted to be appropriate and feasible for a local setting or jurisdiction. Um, if we've made a decision to change practice, that could be start something new, stopping something altogether, tweaking an existing program. Uh, once we've made those decisions, then we need to move into creating a plan to implement that decision. And there would be quite a bit involved in that. And then, of course, we want to know that these changes are resulting in um, uh, the intended outcomes that we're hoping to achieve. So thinking about how would we know that the changes we've made are actually leading us in the right direction towards the outcomes we were hoping to, uh, to uh, achieve. So an evaluation uh, plan. So that's just a little bit about what has guided the NCCMT over the last uh, 12 years and certainly um, has been important uh, in the work that we've been doing. And certainly, um, I'm sure uh, you are all aware that uh, as COVID uh, began just over a year ago and continues, the need for quick evidence, synthesized evidence has been uh, huge, but the capacity, particularly at the, the point of service provision, to keep up to date with the emerging evidence, to make sense of that evidence, to appraise that evidence, to synthesize that evidence, the capacity 
has been um, minimal as everyone has been redeployed at that frontline service provision to activities related uh, to the COVID response. And then that's where NCCMT um, uh, stepped in, in terms of recognizing this large need, recognizing there was limited capacity. Um, and here we were with the ability uh, and the staff to be able to um, step in and start um, uh, seeing if we could address questions that uh, may be arising from uh, the public health sector. And so uh, really that's uh, what resulted in the development of what we call our rapid evidence service. Uh, there was this uh, urgent and ongoing need for synthesis of the COVID evidence. And as many of you would know, new studies were coming out sometimes still on a daily basis. So the evidence was changing almost minute to minute um, and impossible to keep up to date as well as uh, doing service provision. So the there was this ongoing need, little capacity to be able to do that synthesis. Um, there was definitely a, an interest expressed to us uh, very early in COVID. We heard from some local public health units that they were embarking on a rapid review and could we assist them perhaps with uh, refining their question or thinking about where uh, the most efficient places were to search. But very quickly, those who, uh, many who, th who thought they would be able to embark on a rapid review were redeployed. And so we saw the, that need. So we uh, signif um, pivoted significantly from training frontline public health decision makers to do this type of work in evidence synthesis and, and interpretation to actually doing the evidence synthesis and then um, uh, disseminating broadly those uh, knowledge products out into public health. Uh, and so what you'll be hearing more about today is the process as it has uh, evolved from April to now. Um, and definitely thinking about um, this whole service was focused on responding to decision makers requests for evidence on priority topics uh, in public health that would assist in the COVID response. Uh, so just a little bit about uh, what that process has looked like. You can see down the right hand side here that just shows it's uh, we, we're kind of referring to it uh, as a relay race um, as we go from um, receiving questions, prioritizing those questions, um, building on one of our uh, previously released products, our rapid review guidebook, following that, although it's now been uh, tweaked uh, somewhat uh, to be relevant to the COVID evidence. Um, we have different staff that are uh, involved in specific parts of the rapid review process. Uh, and we endeavor to complete the rapid reviews within five to 10 days. It was a little easier to achieve this earlier in the pandemic when there was uh, less evidence, but as um, some of these topics now, there's a very large body of evidence that continues to grow. It can be harder to um, maintain that five to 10 days, but that's definitely what we were endeavoring uh, to do early in the pandemic up until recently. So I'll hand it over to Sarah now to uh, take you through some of the more specifics. Great, thanks Maureen. Um, so this slide just gives you a little bit of a sense of um, what who's involved in this rapid evidence service. So we have uh, a very small but mighty team and I think this slide actually makes it look like our team is bigger than it is because some of the roles that are outlined here are taken on by, uh, by the same person. So we have our scientific director, Maureen Dobbins, who you've already met this morning. We have an operational lead who just devotes a fairly small amount of her overall time to help oversee sort of the administrative logistic aspects of the project, making sure staff time is allocated appropriately. Uh, as we've moved further into the pandemic and we need to balance uh, the work that's being done within our center uh, in the rapid evidence service, but also in ongoing uh, products and projects that are going on in the NCC. Uh, there's certainly a need to, for someone to sort of give the bigger picture oversight and how this work fits into our larger center. 
Uh, I am the rapid evidence service scientific lead, so I oversee uh, sort of some of the most of the methodological decisions in collaboration with the rest of the team, but making sure that those decisions reflect uh, maintaining the rigor of the review while also uh, bringing in some of the feasibility aspects. For each rapid review that we conduct, we have one lead who sort of takes ownership over that review and sees it through to completion. We have our rapid evidence service coordinator who helps to bring all of the different pieces together, outlines our plan on a week to week basis, makes sure, uh, as Maureen mentioned, the relay race, making sure that each part is handed off to the next person at the appropriate time. We have one person who's sort of our search lead, who's most familiar with the different COVID-19 databases and helps to oversee the searching uh, that's done. And then we have uh, a couple of staff that also have been brought in to help with actually conducting the search and some of the initial screening. And then we have a number of support staff, uh, none of which are de dedicating their whole full time to this project, uh, but they help with writing summaries, critical appraisal, and doing all of the pieces that, that bring uh, the evidence together. So the first step in the process, as you can imagine, is receiving the actual questions. So early in the pandemic, we were primarily receiving our questions from uh, our funder, the Public Health Agency of Canada. They do have teams within the Public Health Agency that are responsible for evidence synthesis, but as you can imagine, uh, the capacity was really stretched to the limit. So they reached out to us knowing that we had some of that expertise to help to support their groups. As our rapid evidence service grew and expanded, we continued to receive questions from federal decision makers, as well as provincial and territorial uh, and local public health organizations, and a few questions from some international organizations as well. So we do bring those questions to our weekly team meetings where we assess the progress on the current reviews that we have underway and assess our capacity to take on new reviews. Uh, this is our plan, but sometimes, as you can imagine, particularly early on in the pandemic, there was lots of rapid requests that were coming in that needed a decision right away. So although we try to bring those uh, together on a weekly basis, it doesn't always work out that way. Our main goal in terms of prioritizing uh, questions that we take on is really to avoid duplications. This was a huge problem that we found early on in the pandemic. We would take on a question, we would finish something and find out that there was another group within Canada that had done almost the exact same question simultaneously. So really a waste of resources uh, across a number of groups as we're all working to address many of the questions that we're pressing for a number of organizations across the country and around the world. So that led to uh, our involvement with COVID End, the COVID-19 Evidence Network to support decision making. Uh, so their mandate really is to help reduce that duplication and encourage collaboration. So at this point uh, in our service, every time we do receive a new question from a decision maker or organization, we do uh, connect with the COVID N network to make sure that there's no other synthesis groups uh, within the network that are working on something similar. If no one's working on it, then we may uh, agree to take it on. Or if there have been some examples where someone's working on a very similar question and we're actually able to coordinate and collaborate with other groups to make sure that we're not duplicating efforts. In terms of prioritization, we also want to consider the urgency and relative relevance of the question to the Canadian context. So uh, there's lots of rush for evidence on a number of topics, but we wanna make sure that we are spending and prioritizing our quite limited resources on answering questions that really have um, an ability to have an immediate impact on decision-making or policy that's going to be put into place in Canada. We also need to consider our content expertise in-house to address the question. Early on, uh, you, if you look back to our older reviews, you'll see sort of an evolution of what they looked like. Early on, we focused really on searching for and presenting the available studies, uh, whatever those were. Now we really focus on synthesizing those well and making recommendations. Uh, so we need to make sure that we have the in-house expertise to do that. So questions on uh, some that it may involve more laboratory-based studies uh, that rely heavily on mathematical modeling. We just don't have the in-house expertise to properly critically appraise and synthesize those. So in that case, we try to connect with another group who may have the expertise to do that, but we tend to pass on those types of questions at this point. And we also need to consider the availability of useful evidence. So there are many pressing questions that are coming up on an ongoing basis, but if there's not uh, available evidence to properly synthesize, to be able to put forth something that's useful to decision makers, we sometimes may make the decision not to take on that question uh, if we don't, if after a preliminary scope of what's out there, we don't think that there is sufficient evidence to actually bring forward. 
So once we've decided uh, what question we're going to take on, our next step is really formulating that into a searchable and answerable question. Oftentimes the questions we get from uh, our public health decision makers and organizations uh, are large and sometimes convoluted. So there's always a little bit of back and forth and collaboration with that requester to find out how can we best uh, craft a question to answer, uh, to, be, to serve their needs and answer what they really need to know. So we try to format within the PICO, so population intervention or exposure comparison and outcome format, or sometimes PS, which is population setting, uh, where it's possible. Uh, and then we use that to set our inclusion exclusion criteria for our review. So I've just put an example here on the right hand side of your screen uh, from one of our living rapid reviews on the role of daycares and schools in COVID-19 transmission. So in this review, uh, we focus on children and adolescents ages 1 to 18 while excluding studies that are primarily focused on infants, looking at exposure to or diagnosis of COVID-19. Uh, we include all comparator groups, but outcomes we're really looking at are confirmed or suspected cases in schools, daycares or camp settings, and we exclude extracurricular activities such as sports teams. So it's really important to formulate a solid question early on, sometimes based on volume of evidence, uh, we do need to go back and make some tweaks to make sure that we can answer the question in a reasonable amount of time. And that's one of the main differences between a rapid review and your traditional systematic review where that question is really defined and set out, set in stone from the beginning. Uh, but that's just one of the things that's I think really specific to COVID-19 is that we know we need the evidence in a very rapid uh, time frame, and sometimes uh, due to feasibility constraints, we need to sort of make some adjustments as we go along. So once we have formulated our question, the next step is searching. So we start now by uh, populating a, uh, a template document that we've created on our team uh, with our search strategy. We do predominantly search the COVID-19 specific databases for most of the questions that we take on with some exceptions. So one example uh, would be a rapid review we did on effective risk communication strategies uh, to for COVID-19. So we know that there's some limited evidence around effective risk communication with respect to COVID, but we know there was a huge body of evidence about risk communication from other uh, in other settings and contexts. So in a question like that, we may look outside of the COVID-19 literature to find out uh, what we can bring in that might be applicable. We search for English language uh, studies in both peer reviewed and preprint form. Uh, so that's another one of the things that's become rather unique to the COVID-19 context is uh, the huge uh, explosion of preprint literature, scientific studies that are available before they've been peer reviewed. And we'll talk a little bit about that later on, but that's really been uh, an additional challenge for our team and others is how do we include those peer reviewed studies, uh, non peer reviewed studies appropriately. Depending on the question, we may go to the gray literature uh, or that may be one of the steps in the review process that we omit for feasibility. And we also may include jurisdictional data if it's relevant to the question and helps to uh, enhance our ability to answer the question. We do try to prioritize uh, inclusion of syntheses before single studies. Uh, this is changing a little bit now as it's the syntheses seem to be slowing down, at least for the questions we've taken on recently. Uh, but previously, if we found a really high quality synthesis, so one that had described a comprehensive search strategy, had critically appraised the single studies, uh, in terms of maintaining feasibility and speed, we may uh, present that synthesis along with any studies that have been published since their last search date, rather than including all available studies. So that's one of the sort of shortcut steps that we've introduced in our COVID rapid, rapid evidence service uh, to try to address some of the feasibility issues. And you'll see on the right, uh, an example of one of the search strategy documents uh, for a recent review we did on uh, mitigation strategies in post-secondary institutions. So you'll see the different databases that we've searched there and some of the terms that we've used. And this is just a list of some of the databases that we typically use. Again, they're tweaked uh, according to the question, depending on how relevant. So in terms of the COVID-19 specific databases, uh, we always search like COVID, the WHO's global literature on coronavirus disease, uh, COVID-19 evidence alerts from McMaster Plus and the LOVE, which is the living overview of evidence from Epistemonikos and the Cochrane Coronavirus Special Collections. We typically uh, search 
the GIN, Guidelines International Network Database, the TRIP Medical Database, the MedArchive Preprint Server, and Prospero Registry of Systematic Reviews. So we use that also to just avoid duplication. If we know that someone else has registered a review on a similar topic, we try to reach out and contact those authors in advance of taking on the review. Uh, if it looks like it's supposed to be finished soon to try to avoid duplication. Uh, in terms of other relevant websites or repositories we scan at the NCCMT, we do have a repository of rapid evidence reviews uh, that other authors and synthesis groups can register their questions. So we do scan that to make sure that no one else is, uh, has already completed or is in the process of completing. We look at the other uh, websites of the other national collaborating centers, a number of organizations across Canada and internationally that we know are conducting rapid evidence reviews of the Usher or Uncover Network. Uh, we look at the Center for Disease Control, Public Health England, and the Oxford uh, COVID-19 Evidence Service. In terms of screening, so again, with rapid reviews, we always have some shortcuts that we need to take to maintain uh, feasibility of conducting them on such a rapid time frame. So we do use a single reviewer to conduct our title and abstract screening. More recently, we have adopted uh, the Distiller SR software to we so after we run our search we export all of our results to distiller uh, where we can uh, do title and abstracts reduce our du uh, duplicate hits and do title and abstract screening much more efficiently and one of the really neat features about distiller is it has a function called daisy which actually uh, uses ai to rank the uh, the studies on their uh, likely relevance so we have that actually brings up the most relevant studies to the top of the pile and allows our screeners to go through the most relevant studies more quickly. Uh, well, and then having someone be able to start on the summaries to sort of progress things a little bit faster while we're screening the rest of the um, sort of less likely to be included studies. There's also um, a function in there where you can double check your screening. So the DAISY function will flag certain studies that it thinks you might have missed. So it's not perfect, it's not quite as strong as having two independent reviewers, but it allows us to do a little bit of a double check and like makes us a little bit more confident that we may, that uh, confident that we haven't missed something along the way. Not all of the databases allow us to export. So things like Prospero, some of the COVID-19 specific databases don't have a great export function as well as the websites that we typically scan. So those are manually screened and uh, potentially el eligible studies are tracked in Excel. And then a single reviewer, who's usually the rapid review lead, uh, conducts the full text screening. And then that eligibility is double checked when the summary writers are writing the, are extracting the data and writing the summary for each study. So in terms of data extraction, uh, data extraction again is completed by one single reviewer and then double checked by the rapid review lead at the final synthesis stage. So across most of our reviews, the key information that we extract are things like study design, the study population, the setting, summary of the key findings. We also uh, include a quality rating and then other relevant information is needed. Uh, so for example, in our review of schools and daycares, we always make sure that we extract any IPAC measures that were in place and that sort of tweaked uh, and refined depending on the question. So one of the things that we felt very strongly about throughout uh, conducting our rapid evidence service was the inclusion of critical appraisal of single studies. So early on uh, back in April 2020, so about a year ago when we started the rapid evidence service, preprints were accounting for about 40% of all English language COVID-19 scientific work. Um, so we, without having gone through the peer review process, we knew that those needed to be considered a little bit more carefully than other uh, published studies. Even the published studies, we knew that they were being pushed through relatively quickly. Uh, there were a lot more, we were hearing about a lot more retractions from studies that had errors on a closer look. So we felt that it was really important to critically appraise the evidence so that when we presented it back to our decision makers or knowledge users, that we could highlight which studies were the most trustworthy of the bunch that we had. Um, at the time that we started the rapid evidence service, there were very few other syntheses that were appraising evidence, which we really found problematic with a huge uh, explosion of evidence, as Maureen mentioned, that was changing you know, almost on a daily basis. How could we highlight for our decision makers which things were most trustworthy and which studies, uh, which were oftentimes conflicting decisions should be based upon?
So our critical appraisal is always completed by one reviewer and verified by a second, and any conflicts that arise are resolved through discussion or the input from, a rapid, from the rapid review lead as needed. We use a variety of tools depending on the study design. So for systematic reviews, we use the AMSTAR 1 tool. Uh, for any guidelines that we find, we use the Agree 2 tool. And then for all other study designs, so our case controls, our cohort studies, our randomized control trials, our quasi-experimental studies, we use the Joanna Briggs Institute checklist. So those are fairly easy to use uh, and user-friendly. And then rather than providing uh, the actual score or the full critical appraisal checklist for each study, we rate each study as strong, moderate, or low quality. Uh, and, the, and those are included in the review. And then always our critical appraisal is available upon request for anyone who's interested in, in reading that a little more closely. One of the things that again has evolved over time is our inclusion of grade. Uh, in our appraisal of this overall certainty of evidence. So throughout the, the, our service, we've always included critical appraisal, but one of the things that we found was becoming an issue is that a lot of the studies that we were relying on were case reports or case series or cross-sectional studies that well, were fairly well done and were rating as moderate or high quality using those critical appraisal tools. We know that uh, case control and, and cross-sectional studies were, had some inherent bias uh, that we want that wasn't being reflected just in the critical appraisal scores. So we adopted the grade uh, process, which is grading of recommendations, assessment, development, and evaluation, which really lets us uh, allows us to kind of ask the question: How likely are the findings to change with more evidence? So while we ha may have lots of consistent evidence from high quality case reports, we know that because of the inherent bias in a case report, if we were to conduct, for example, a long, an, an observational cohort study, that our findings actually may be quite different. So we assess the certainty of the findings overall across studies based on the eight key domains from grade, risk of bias, which is considered through our critical appraisal or quality assessment, the uh, consistency of effects across the studies, the indirectness of the interventions and outcomes, uh, how imprecise the effect estimates may be, potential for publication bias, the magnitude of the effect, uh, any dose response relationships that are seen, and then how well the studies account for confounding. And each of these uh, is combined to come up with an overall certainty of findings as either very low, meaning we're very uncertain and, and not confident in these findings at all, uh, low certainty, which means the findings may are likely to change as more uh, evidence becomes available, Moderate certainty, where the findings may change, but we're fairly confident in uh, sort of the direction of the effect or strong evidence where we feel confident that the magnitude of the effect and the potential uh, effect size is captured fairly accurately. So our final product, um, this is the front page uh, of a review we did back in the fall about the risk of COVID-19 transmission in different indoor settings. So we always frame our question first, followed by an executive summary with our key findings and the certainty of evidence with our grade statements. Uh, if it's an update to a previously conducted review, we make sure we highlight anything that's changed. So new studies that have been added and any changes that we've made to the eligibility criteria along the way. Then we provide a, a summary of the overview of the evidence and any key knowledge gaps that remain. That comes, that's followed by a short methods section and then our results, which we don't, uh, we don't synthesize our results narratively. We present the tables and that synthesis really is uh, limited to the executive summary, which is upfront so that uh, decision makers can quickly go there and get the key take home messages. Uh, in terms of our dissemination, all of our reviews are available on uh, nccmt.ca slash res, which you can see a screenshot here on the right hand side. Uh, as of this month, we've completed 28 full reviews and 25 updates, and we have two more underway currently. All our reviews are posted online. Uh, we have a number of email notifications, so we do have a subscription service for those who are interested in uh, being alerted as soon as a new review is posted. And we do some targeted email notifications for key decision makers, depending on what the question is. We post all of our reviews on social media and through our monthly newsletter. And depending on the question, we may disseminate through our McMaster communications and PR team. So I will turn it back over to Maureen, who's going to talk a little bit about uh, the impact of the, our rapid evidence service so far. Great, thanks so much, uh, Sarah. And I do see that there are a few uh, questions in the Q&A, and so we'll uh, get to those 
uh, in a few minutes, I'll just wrap up here with a few final um, impact measures. So what you see uh, in front of you here um, on the right hand side is a depiction of uh, usage uh, of the website uh, from uh, more than 69 countries around the world. Uh, the darker blue indicates um, uh, more visitors from that jurisdiction, um, but it is it is a resource that's being uh, used uh, quite a bit. Um, we've the page itself uh, that Sarah was just showing you there, where we uh, post all of the links to the rapid reviews, has been viewed more than twenty five thousand times from June when we created the page until April. Uh, we have responded to questions from uh, organizations uh, not only within Canada, but also external. So the World Health Organization, uh, Public Health Ontario, other public health units. Uh, we were really delighted uh, to collaborate with Public Health England uh, recently uh, on an update. Um, we have uh, email subscribers uh, from folks in nearly every province and territory in Canada. We know that our reviews are being indexed in many of the COVID uh, databases, which is fantastic. And also uh, some of the rapid reviews have been really picked up by various media outlets, for example, the uh, rapid review on uh, schools and daycares, which has been updated 14 times, has been um, picked up by about 30 outlets. Sarah was extremely uh, busy in the summer and uh, fall uh, uh, on many either radio talk shows, um, on TV. Uh, this was a really hot topic um, in our country and in several provinces. Um, of course, there are um, some ongoing challenges uh, with this type of um, with this type of an initiative. And so, as as Sarah has uh, indicated throughout uh, her presentation, um, there are trade offs with a rapid review. So, in order to be able to really look at the evidence quickly. Uh, you have to make uh, decisions about what you're not going to do in that, what would otherwise be a full systematic review process. So always trying to um, balance um, the most rigor that is feasible to do in a certain timeline and also, um, uh, you know, being clear with the requester um, what those trade-offs are when, when we have to make those difficult decisions, either about uh, the extent of the search or, um, uh, I mean, we weren't willing to not do critical appraisal, but, you know, choosing to go with one person and then double checking as opposed to two independent raters. So just various uh, decisions can have uh, impacts on the trustworthiness of the findings. So I think being really clear with your requester what those different decisions that go with the timeline have. Minimizing uh, the duplication, it's, as I'm sure uh, all of you would agree, it's impossible to stay uh, up to date with everything that everybody is doing. And so, uh, we can't say that there hasn't been uh, duplication, but we have done uh, as much as we can to reach out to others and really, uh, you know, check before starting any rapid reviews to see what else is already ongoing. Um, and, and, you know, sometimes it's hard yourself to stay up to date, like making sure you're posting everything. We're working on this review. We're working on this review. So sometimes you don't know until a review has been posted that someone was working on it, but we've certainly um, tried to be involved in various groups to be looking for that. Um, as an example, very early on, um, one of our earlier rapid reviews was on the impact of COVID uh, on um, maternal infant outcomes. And I think we originally did that review maybe May, and then we did an update again in the summer, maybe end of July, early August. Uh, and in that uh, time, we identified uh, more than 50 rapid reviews 
on the exact same topic that included diff, you know, some but not all of the same uh, evidence. And actually we stopped counting at 50. Um, there were likely many more beyond that. So that's just you know, one indication of the magnitude of the duplication issue going on there. Um, you know, the next point about getting the right information into the hands of the right people as fast as possible, definitely something we're all trying to do, but also a, a huge challenge because those decision makers have no time to read emails, um, completely uh, inundated with uh, new information. And so what are the effective strategies to really make sure you're you know, in real time as much as possible, getting that information. Um, and what was the right information? We were really lucky early on to uh, work uh, closely with um, senior decision makers who were able to say, you know, that traditional type of write-up of a synthesis of, or a systematic review with a lot of text was not wanted or needed. Um, our first, as Sarah was indicating, in terms of the way we might have first provided it, in terms of here's a list of studies, here's uh, what they said, um, also needed to um, move along in terms of what's the higher level synthesis and interpretation. Um, so really this, it was important as much as possible to connect with our decision makers to really understand what do they need um, and what format is going to be the most useful for them. Um, of course, the proactive versus reactive. So in the early, early days, uh, we were just doing our best to try to keep up with the questions as they were coming in. And eventually we started thinking about, you know, what are questions that are going to be coming? Can we anticipate what some of the future questions are going to be uh, so that we could start taking a look at that um, um, because so much uh, in COVID has been trying to catch up, um, but it was really important to start thinking about what might be coming to be prepared for that. Um, moving to the next point about, well, when is the evidence uh, out of date? So when do we need to consider that it's out of date? We definitely were in the position where a few times uh, we were posting a review, Sarah had this happen to her uh, almost every time with the schools and daycare review as the lead on that review, where we already knew the day we were posting it, there was a new study that had been released or two or three that had all the media attention. And so there was a question of, well, do we still post the one we've done or do we delay and now include these new studies? So we really had to think about what to do with that. And, and how long does it take to be out of date? And so that again, everything has been in flux through COVID um, in, in those first weeks and months, something might be out of date within days. Um, uh, now we might be in, in a position where maybe it's some weeks or months it's, and it depends on the topic again, some have slowed down a little, some are still speeding up, some, some have stayed at steady state of constant new uh, studies. An additional question there is also, um, as we receive qu new questions now, we have to think carefully as to whether or not uh, data that would emerge that's there from the very beginning weeks and months of COVID is relevant to the situation now, um, because that could add uh, tens, you know, 10, 20, 30 or more studies to your rapid review. And yet it's from a time that's completely different from what we know now. So those are some of the issues that we've um, been grappling with in terms of that changing um, methodology. Um, and then also thinking about, you know, how applicable is uh, evidence from other jurisdictions for Canada and, and those of you that are joining us from uh, other countries today, I'm sure um, think about this as well. So uh, how do you take evidence that's, that's uh, coming from many different parts of the world, thinking about how that applies within Canada and then within specific jurisdictions within Canada, um, and as well, when you are creating uh, these knowledge products that are, let's say, for a national scope, 
but then there may be additional work needed for a specific jurisdiction in Canada, maybe at that provincial level or maybe at the level of a regional health authority uh, or a city or a town. Um, more work still needs to be done to think about how that may apply uh, locally. Uh, and then just around the, the, the low quality of the evidence, a little bit also was around the reporting of the evidence um, in the rush to get the, the data that was emerging so rapidly uh, early in, in COVID. Um, many times papers were coming out really with the data, but almost no methods or no methods uh, at all. And so that was uh, challenging in terms of um, how to use that. Um, and there really wasn't time to, to, to be going back to authors and asking them uh, for details on the methods of the study, um, but rather, you know, in, in only having a few days, it can be really challenging uh, to address those uh, issues. So just in relation to the, you know, wrapping up this part in terms of conclusions and implications, um, you know, th that it was, uh, this was all actually a bit of an experiment for us in that this significant pivot from training uh, others in how to do some of this work to actually being the doers uh, of this work, but it did uh, result in a rapidly coordinated uh, effort on a national scale. Um, certainly participating in COVID end uh, that has a network with a great many evidence synthesis teams and others across Canada and even relationships to um, many other partners outside of Canada through that has really helped to build um, a sense of community and how to work together. Uh, there's still work to be done, um, but, but definitely that sharing uh, of knowledge, sharing of resources around uh, methods and tools, um, and, and hopefully in some way avoiding um, uh, or reducing along the way some of the duplication and trying to, at the end of this, um, you know, ha have a role to play in, in making sure that the best quality evidence was getting into the hands of decision makers as fast as we could get it there. Maybe an ongoing, I hope, positive challenge uh, to come from uh, COVID will be decision makers and policy makers now very versed in uh, evidence informed uh, practice. So that's, you know, the glass is half full. There's this demand for evidence like there never has been before and asking a needing a wanting of that. Um, uh, however, I think we've we've created an expectation that it is possible to produce good quality evidence in days. Uh, and we need to be thinking about is that feasible to maintain? How can that be maintained uh, into the future in order to keep uh, supporting evidence informed policies and practices? Um, for those that uh, are systematic reviewers, um, Cochrane folks who would be well versed in you develop your protocol a priori and you don't change those methods, um, a lot of that has needed to go out the window really with COVID because as the evidence has changed, uh, the evidence ecosystem, we've heard that term quite a bit, um, we need to constantly go back and, and think about the rapid review methodology and figure out what is working, what is no longer working, and then tweak those methods as we go. So, you know, um, ma maintaining our ties to you know, the rigor of synthesis methodology that's been developed over decades uh, around the world. But in terms of the, the, the feasibility of maintaining all of those, we've had to be um, very responsive to uh, as the evidence has changed, as the, the ecosystem has evolved, then we've had to change um, those methods. And sometimes it's, you know, we realize after a couple of weeks, something isn't working right, like the way it had been. We have to stop, take stock. And, and uh, in those instances, I've said, I think we're gonna need to change this part of a strategy of a, of a method within the rapid review. And then, and then, 
you know, sure enough, that was what was causing an issue. And then, and then we've moved on from there. So it's um, becoming comfortable with evolving methods, basically on the fly, um, as something that we've learned quite a bit about through all of this. And uh, what we're very much hoping to do uh, is to impart um, this knowledge on to others who may want to take up the charge in terms of moving into uh, evidence syntheses. Uh, so through this, we, we've um, utilized a fair number of tools. We've created some new uh, processes. Um, um, we have experience in terms of uh, how we've quickly onboarded new staff and provided virtual training. Um, and we're hoping very much to be able to pass that knowledge on to others so that uh, other groups will have this knowledge, you know, in the post, well, the current and post pandemic uh, recovery period to continue on with uh, our rapid reviews. So um, I will just ask a question here to Emily. Are we going to questions before we go to any of the polling questions? Is that what yeah, you we'll, do, we'll do questions now and then polling questions before we wrap up. Perfect. Uh, wonderful. So we invite your questions now. Um, we have accumulated a number in the Q&A, so I'm going to start uh, start there. Uh, the first question was, how many team members in total are working on this service um, or full-time equivalents? So thanks, Emily, for uh, compiling this information for me. So we have 11 individuals in total, um, resulting in between three to four FTEs. Uh, working on the RES. So it does, um, as I mentioned, we do have a number of other products that are going on within the NCC. So that does shift a little bit week to week, um, but roughly three to four across 11 people. Okay. And have you done any checks on the effect um, on quality and on the results of using only one reviewer for screening, selection, and data extraction? Mm -hmm. So in terms of screening and selection, we haven't looked at that in terms of uh, officially in terms of how that impacts our results. One thing that we do do is when we're training and onboarding uh, any of our staff to, con to take on that step, we have done a trial period where we have usually that person with what with the rapid review lead, lead both go through at least a section uh, of the results to make sure that nothing was missed or maybe it was another staff who'd been doing it previously. So we have done that in terms of onboarding uh, and that that uh, any staff we bring on doesn't take on that screening uh, on their own until they've had a couple of tries uh, where nothing is missed. So that's one thing that we've done. Um, and with using the new, dis with using Distiller now, which we've been doing for the last several rounds of reviews, um, having that AI function as a double check as well, it just brings up, you know, there may be 10 or 20 studies that the AI function thinks we should have included and then uh, the rapid review lead will go through and just take a quick double check at those. And so far we haven't uh, found any that were missed based on that. So uh, we also look to, when we find syntheses, we do do a scan of the studies that are included in the other syntheses to make sure that we didn't miss any. Uh, and so with those things, we feel fairly confident that we do collect most, if not all of the studies. Um, but certainly it is a limitation that we're very upfront with in, in our methods that you know, that is one of the decisions that we've had to make. If I just jump in there as well, um, you know, it's it's one of the challenges when you jump into the mix and we, we um, many times have struggled to keep up with the requests. Um, as Sarah said, with a pretty, pretty small team um, versus the all the other things that we would like to do, such as this, like really testing to see. But, um, if anyone's thinking of um, a master's, this would be a great uh, little master's project, not little, but uh, this would uh, would be a great master's thesis uh, to take a look at that if anyone's interested. Great. Um, our next question was about which tool do we use to assess the risk of bias in case series and case reports? Uh, that question was answered in the chat. Um, uh, Dr. Neil Stramko or Dr. Dobbins, did you want to address that in any way? 
or we can move on. Um, yeah, JBI Tools, happy. If anyone has any questions about tools, I'm happy to, to talk more about our decision for those, uh, but those are the ones that we use. Great. Um, our next question was whether there is a place for qualitative researchers in rapid reviews, um, or is it necessary to have a quantitative background to be able to critically appraise studies such as systematic reviews? That's a great question. I think it probably the the skill set required is probably dependent on the question. We just uh, are right now working on our first rapid review related to COVID that is restricted to qualitative and mixed method studies. So that's required a bit of a revamp um, just in terms of the way we think about study quality in terms of critical appraisal and the way that we pull out the key messages and you know all of the inherent differences between quant and qual research in general, it applies to how you synthesize those so that's been a bit of a learning curve for our group as well. Um, so I think there's certainly a role for qualitative researchers, particularly for questions that are most appropriately answered by qualitative research. Um, in, if you were to look more broadly, I think some training in quantitative methods, if you were including a number of study designs would certainly be helpful. Um, I don't know if you have anything to add, Maureen. Yeah, the only other thing I would add there is, um, uh, you know, in my opinion, anybody can learn how to critically appraise uh, systematic reviews, uh, randomized control trials. Um, I've certainly had uh, high school students, uh, first year, second year students that uh, we've trained to do critical appraisal of systematic reviews. Um, and so I don't think there's any particular um, you know, minimum set of, of knowledge. I think it's all, all uh, teachable. And I certainly think that, um, you know, we would, we would label the reviews we're doing more as narrative, right? We're not doing meta-analyses. Uh, so there's a uh, qualitative component to pulling the data out and making sense of it that I think the skills of qualitative researchers in that part of uh, learning from the data uh, would would be very, very useful in this work as well. Great, thank you. Um, the next question is whether we do a pre-scope search to see if the review is feasible. Uh, for example, is there evidence to review or do we just head straight to producing the review? Yeah, good question. Uh, I mean, certainly in some questions, we know that there is evidence. Um, sometimes someone comes up, comes to us with a question, and here's five studies I've come across. And so that sort of limits the amount of pre-scope. But we do always do a bit, of, we try to do a bit of a pre-scope uh, to see what kind of things are out there, um, how useful the evidence might be, as well as helping to develop our search strategy in terms of the different terminology and search terms we might use. Many of the COVID databases aren't indexed with um, subject headings and mesh terms that you know, we would see in, in Medline and the databases that uh, those of us who work with in systematic reviews may typically work with. So sometimes we need to do a little bit of a pre-scope even just to help develop our search strategy. So that's usually part of one of our first steps as we're refining the question. And sometimes it is, you know, we start with a bigger question, we start to look at what's out there, we see there's a ton and we really need to narrow the scope, whether by jurisdiction, geography, by population, a number of different factors we may consider depending on the question. And that's some of those decisions about the, the framing of the question is in that pre-scope step. Great. Um, the next question, uh, thanks so much for the great presentation. Are there opportunities to work with your group to learn and apply COVID-related reviews? Yes, please. <laughs> Absolutely. I mean, we do have a number uh, of resources on uh, the NCCMT website already. Maybe, I don't know if uh, maybe Emily or uh, Isabel could pop some of those into the chat. The Rapid Review Guidebook that Maureen mentioned is a really great place to start. Uh, but, but I think you know, we're certainly open to collaboration. So, Great. Uh, I, I could just add there as well that we have done some uh, uh, organization specific webinars uh, around our rapid review methodology. Um, so to try to really pass this knowledge on, on to others, we are very much interested in doing that. So if you wanna connect with us, um, that's something we could discuss further. Great. And some partnered reviews as well, one that we've done already that Maureen mentioned with Public Health England, another one that we're just sort of starting to, to scope out a little bit more with another organization around 
uh, sort of sharing those resources as a little bit of a training as well. Great. Um, the next question asks, uh, could you please describe how you are using Grade in a rapid review? How are you making it rapid? Um, and are you using Grade Pro? Great question. So we are not using Grade Pro. Um, you know, I'm going to. Sh there's a great paper um, by the one of the, the Grade Working Group about how to adapt the Grade process in terms of. I think that it's about emergency and urgent situations. And they give an example. Um, it was a group from McMaster, and they had done a review on face masks early on in the pandemic. And they describe. So usually, uh, for those of you who are familiar with Grade, a lot of it's based on. Um, on the meta-analysis that's conducted. Um, so if you look at a Cochrane review, you'll see the meta-analysis, the effect size, the variation, the heterogeneity, and the, in that a lot of that is used to inform decisions about the certainty of evidence. So with our rapid reviews, uh, we're not doing a meta-analysis. So it's certainly an adapted grade approach and happy to share that paper because that's really informed the way that we've approached uh, using grades. So, I mean, maybe you could consider it sort of grade light. Um, it, it certainly doesn't take us a lot of time. And I think in that paper, they talked about it adding about 30 minutes to their overall methods of conducting that review is to, as a group, come up with that together. Um, so it's following the same sort of steps in grade. You know, if you have uh, randomized control trial evidence, you know, your baseline start is high quality, and then you downgrade based on the number of steps, and then you can upgrade based on um, things like dose response and whatnot. Um, if you're starting with observational evidence, you're automatically starting at a lower level of certainty with opportunity to upgrade or downgrade. So still following through with those same steps and, and approach, but the um, the information is a bit, probably a bit more based on our judgment than on um, some of the numbers that you would get from a meta-analysis. So, um, But certainly happy to chat more offline. Uh, and I can pull up that paper and pop it into the chat if you're interested. Thank you. Uh, love the next question. Um, how do you or your staff cope with stress, burnout, fatigue? Um, have you or your colleagues colleagues experienced burnout with regard to the ongoing work and repetition? Um, please share any thoughts and solutions that you have. So uh, <clears throat> what, what could be interesting is uh, to hear from all three of us because we have three different perspectives. Um, and if you, you know, you, you really want to hear their answers, I'll like cover my ears. So Sarah <laughs> and Emily <laughs> speak frankly, but you raise a really, really important um, point. Um, and, and many would likely have heard that at the beginning, it was the sprint. Uh, and you can only run the 100 meters at full speed for so long. And then everyone started getting exhausted. And now we're into the marathon or either the ultra marathon. I don't even know what to call it now that we're you know, 14 or so months in. <clears throat> and so this is uh, really important. I would, I guess, you know, th there's a few things to say here in that um, maybe uh, I'm a bit biased, but the the work was energizing in that um, with, with this uh, small team and actually a relatively young team, there was a lot of uh, pride um, and ex an excitement in being involved in these rapid reviews that were being asked for by very senior uh, groups. Um, you know, when, when we received an email from the WHO asking uh, about a rapid review or some of the other international organizations or um, Public Health Agency of Canada, you know, that, that was energizing in terms of being called upon to play a very significant role. So that definitely helped, um, was important. Um, it was really important. You know, we, we felt really important to be contributing in this way. Uh, and then, you know, you have me who felt very much uh, wanting to say yes to every uh, every request. Um, and as uh, Emily and Sarah would, you know, politely say, you know, I, I had to be reined in. Um, because couldn't uh, say yes to everything. And that was the idea of implementing a weekly meeting uh, where we could then, uh, and having a coordinator um, and even our operational lead who had the big picture of what else were we working on and how much time could we, should we give to this and who was doing what to keep it all uh, coordinated was really, really important. Um, thinking carefully about eventually how many could we do. So in our first, maybe our second week into this, we completed five rapid reviews in one week. 
um, everyone was so happy when we got to Friday, I think, not only because we finished them all and we were really excited about that, but we were all exhausted. So we knew that we couldn't keep doing um, that pace. And so it, it kind of eventually over time got to about maybe two per week, but not always two every single week. Um, because some of them now do move into um, more to that 10 day period. Um, we also implemented, I forget when we did this, maybe September ish or so, um, about every six weeks, we take a week where we, do, we don't do um, any rapid review. So that is a, it's not a vacation week, but it's a non rapid review week. So that gives everybody. Um, all of the staff involved time to work on other projects um, as, as well. Although we have um, a strategic meeting during that week to think bigger picture, plan out longer uh, what we're doing. Um, and uh, also, I would the last point I'll make there is uh, we really uh, have about probably four to five, six months in, really started thinking about what are we in the best position? What questions are we in the best position to answer? And so we started, um, you know, really thinking carefully about the requests and, um, you know, very much on those that are, you know, public health in terms of uh, chronic disease prevention, I mean, and, and you know, we've done ones on um, the impact of COVID on opioids, on food security, on mental health. Um, so those are the ones that that's the kind of evidence we have the skills, the best skill set. We are not the experts in um, efficacy of vaccines, uh, in the sensitivity and specificity of uh, COVID tests. Uh, so we, we move, really moved out of that space and we would actually spend more time now trying to, if there's a request for that, trying to connect them with groups that we know uh, through COVID and that someone else is better positioned to do those. So we're, we're definitely not trying to do um, everything with that. Um, and I don't know, I'll just pass it over to you, Sarah, if there's anything else and then you, Emily. I think it can be challenging because we're all bombarded at certain times of the pandemic, I think in particular, where we're all bombarded as well in our personal lives with news and restrictions and, you know, all of those things. And then when we're working on reading COVID literature at work too, it can become a bit overwhelming. So I, I'm, I personally have sometimes in those periods, you know, I'm like, I don't read the news then. I just have to take a time out of the news or on the weekends or things like that. Um, so, but I think one of the things that has really helped with our team is having, I, I think we've established quite a good team environment. We have just outside of our rapid evidence service, just making sure that we have, you know, um, a good working environment. We you know, try to do something fun on Fridays. We haven't done that in a little while now. We should probably revisit that, but, but trying to bring some of those in just to make sure that the team overall, not just the RES team, but people feel supported. There's lots of flexibility. If, you know, uh, as children are at home and all of these kind of things, I think we, Maureen's done a really great job and all of us have done a great job of setting up a really collaborative and supportive work environment on our team overall that I think helps to buffer some of those pieces. Great, and I think the only thing that I would, I would add is that we, um, I mean, building on what Sarah said about a great working environment um, and a great team environment is that, um, I mean, when we do our, our assignments, you know, this person will do the uh, critical appraisals, this person will write the summaries. There's a lot of back and forth um, between, you know, myself as the coordinator and that person. What does your week look like next week? We have 20 summaries to write. How many of those do you think you can manage realistically next week? Um, checking in very often, um, you know, how, how far along are you? Um, do you need more time? Should we, you know, so-and-so has finished theirs. Should we, you know, redistribute with them as well? So just, um, I think, and I, which I, which I, I hope, um, makes thing, make them, makes, makes everyone feel like they really are a, a valued member of the team and that they are, um, at least somewhat in charge of what they what they do take on um, and that they they do feel empowered to, to say no um, or I need help when they when they really do. So we're hoping that this doesn't become so overwhelming as as reviews get bigger and bigger as the as the literature grows. So 
Great, thank you. Great question. Um, our, our next question is, um, how does our team decide when a rapid review gets updated? Um, are updates done on a fixed timeline or are updates done based on new emerging evidence or demand? Yeah, great question. It's a bit of, um, and it depends. Um, so for example, um, the schools and daycares review that we did, we had first done that for, I think the first one we did was one of our very earliest ones back in May. Um, and at least in Canada, all schools were closed and had sort of looked like they were going to be for the rest of the school year, which went to June. That question came through. Um, I can't recall whether we had a request to update or we decide, made the decision to update uh, at the beginning of the summer, just knowing that some of those decisions were being made. Uh, and then as um, with that one in particular, we did have a period of time where we, because the evidence was coming out so rapidly, it was such a hot newsworthy topic and ongoing decisions were being made about reopening childcare, schools, how to reopen, um, things like that. So that one in particular, given the sort of importance and ongoing decisions about that topic, uh, there was a period of time where we were updating I think maybe at some point weekly or bi-weekly uh, and then as sort of thing the evidence slowed down and, and schools in Canada had reopened we did slow that one down a little bit and then at certain sort of key decision points we've decided to ramp up or if we get a request so that one um, sort of waxes and wanes a little bit uh, most of the time it is based on either an, another request for an update uh, or that there's some indication for some reason that that is now uh, an upcoming important topic again. Um, so that, it's sort of a mix, mixed amount of information, but not typically, uh, I don't think there's been any that we've updated, had sort of, we must revisit every month just for the sake of having a timeline per se. Great. Um, the next question comes from Saskatchewan. Uh, when faced with a question requiring a review within three to four days and an evidence search that uncovers, say, 50 or 60 suitable studies, have we used or considered using parallel reviewers, uh, each reviewing 10 to 15 studies, with a subsequent joint compilation of the evidence rather than one reviewer going through all 60 studies? Could this permit a rapid response, but still maintain adequate quality assessment of individual studies? Yeah, great point. And, and that is what we do, what ends up happening for most, if they're particularly if there's a large number of studies, um, it's usually divided amongst a couple of summary writers. Uh, and then that's brought back together by the rapid review lead when they create the executive summary. Um, certainly makes it feasible if, with timelines to divide uh, amongst a number of staff, sometimes it can be challenging to bring that in back together with different voices and different people pulling those. So that's been a bit of work on our end in terms of training uh, our staff and lots of ongoing uh, conversations about what's the key pieces and things like that. But that um, when we talk about the 11 people over three to four FTEs, that's because we do have we do have two staff as well that work more on a contract basis. They have other full time jobs uh, and work with us more on a contract basis. So they do uh, some of those summary writing sort of in the evenings and on weekends. Um, so that's one way we've been able to achieve those timelines. Yeah, and if I uh, just uh, add a little bit um, to that, I think uh, the the two of the contractors that Sarah just mentioned are themselves public health professionals who are coming home from their busy day jobs and helping us look at this uh, evidence. So I think it, it says a lot about how important this is uh, to those who, who are already super busy that they, they wanna be involved. What also helped was a partnership with the uh, Luke Wolfenden's group in Australia. Um, he runs the Cochrane Public Health uh, group there. And uh, he was able to lend us uh, someone for I think eight to 12 weeks. Uh, and that was actually perfect because at the end of our day, uh, which was getting into the start of their day, Emily was able to send you know, uh, a number of uh, studies to say, can you do the appraisal and or data extraction summaries for these? And then they'd be in Emily's inbox when she showed up to work the next day. So that actually is a great example of in different time zones can really work to uh, our advantage as well. Great, thank you. Um, 
The next question asks if we've received demands or um, have we collaborated with organizations from Quebec, uh, wondering if the language was a potential barrier. Great question. I can't recall, and maybe Emily, you might have a better sense of whether we have any questions. Uh, sometimes we get, have questions funneled through, for example, the public health agency. We don't know necessarily who that question in particular has come from, uh, but I don't recall any that have come from Quebec in particular. Um, we did do a bit of a training session. Maureen, which group was that with back in the fall? That was uh, with INSPQ. Who, who are moving into doing rapid reviews. And so we, we did uh, go over with them very similar type of webinar in terms of what our process was. Yeah, we did have a request um, for an update on a review and, and could we potentially collaborate on one? And um, But it was on a specific topic that we ended up not pursuing, um, but we did have a couple conversations with them. Um, I mean, thankfully on for, for, for ourselves, um, really excellent English speakers uh, from that group. So uh, there were no barriers at that time, but it hasn't, uh, it hasn't come up as often. So great. Um, that is the last question that I see, um, although I do see a couple of different notes um, about a new uh, COVID-19 evidence center in Wales, uh, which is very exciting. So please feel free to send us an email. Um, our email should be on this, uh, will come up on one of the later slides. Um, what I'll do right now is switch us into our last uh, few polling questions. Um, what we're really hoping to get here is some feedback on both uh, the rapid reviews that we have uh, posted uh, and completed and posted online, um, as well as on the webinar itself. Um, we use this information to inform future webinars, inform future projects. Um, we really do take quite a bit of time uh, reviewing this, this evaluation data so that we, we can uh, tailor uh, what we do in the future. Um, so I'm just looking at uh, the responses coming in. So it looks like most people have responded um, and it's about a 50-50 split in terms of people who have actually used the reviews uh, to inform decision-making, which is, which is really exciting to see actually um, that, these have been, that these have been out there. Um, and then the next question is actually a follow-up question. Um, we're interested to know um, how um, these reviews were used. Um, if, if you did say yes, if you have used these reviews, either yourself or your organization. Um, and if you said that you haven't, um, we're curious to see why not so that we know, um, so that we can learn um, how to make sure that we get these, these, hand, uh, these reviews into uh, the hands of people who do need to be doing this work um, most effectively. So we very much appreciate your time uh, answering this question. Um, so I do see the responses coming in, which is which is really fantastic. Thank you so much. Um, I'll give it another few seconds, as I'm sure people are uh, typing there, and then we'll move into uh, webinar feedback. Um, but really, a, a fantastic presentation going through um, all the steps and all the troubleshooting and uh, revisions to the process over the over the course of really a, a year now. Um, it's, it's really great to see everything summarized so so nicely and really see the journey that we were on from, you know, five reviews in a week to, well, it does take a little bit longer now and there is more evidence. So um, really, really nice to see that. Um, and thank you to everybody for your uh, wonderful engagement during the session. Um, some really, really excellent questions that we hope, um, we hope our answers have, have been helpful. So that's great. Um, thank you so much to everybody who provided a response here. Um, and then more general webinar feedback. Um, we are interested to see um, whether or not this webinar has helped uh, to increase your knowledge and understanding of, of what really goes into evidence-informed decision-making. Um, there should be five options there. And again, just make sure that you hit submit so that your answer gets recorded. And I see that one. Uh, that one should open up in a second. I know there is sometimes just a little bit of a delay there. Oh, and it turns out that our uh, person in charge of polling is having some internet questions. So I'm gonna see if I can do this. Um, so hopefully that has come up on your screen. This isn't usually my job, but hopefully that's shown up. Um, and we'll wait just a second for some responses to come in. Uh, Isabella is just refreshing her browser. 
and that's no problem. I see the responses coming in, so this seems to be working well, so no problems there. Um, some really positive responses. Thank you so much. Uh, wonderful to see those. And that's great. Um, so we'll close this question. Um, our next question is whether or not the information from today's webinar uh, will be useful in your own practice. Um, again, there's five options there. Um, make sure that once you select your option um, that you uh, hit submit on your on your answer so that it does get recorded. Um, and I see those responses coming in. Looks like this will be useful. Uh, really, really wonderful to see that. Uh, and thank you to everybody for taking the time, sticking with us and, and providing these responses. Uh, this is this is very, very helpful for us. That's great. Um, and then the last question that we have here is just um, asking about your experience with today's webinar. Um, you can check all of the answers that, that apply for you, um, whether you felt that the webinar was relevant uh, to yourself and to your public health practice, uh, whether you felt that the webinar was effectively facilitated, whether there were opportunities to participate, um, whether the webinar was easy to follow along, and whether we were able to meet your expectations for this webinar. Um, so you can go ahead and click on any of the answers that, um, that you feel apply. Um, and again, make sure that you that you hit submit for those. I see most of these are coming in. It looks like we have quite a few responses. Again, thank you so much to everybody who has stuck around um, till the end here. And that's great. Um, jumping back into the chat. Um, great, wonderful to see that um, uh, there's some appreciation for the platform, the Big Marker platform. Um, instead of Zoom. I know everybody is, has a bit of Zoom fatigue, so this one's a little bit different, um, but does offer quite a few of the same, the same functions, which is, which is really great. Um, so with that, um, thank you so much to everybody who has uh, joined us today. Um, you can learn more about our uh, other webinars that we do offer um, on our webpage. Um, that link should be posted in the chat in a couple of seconds um, so that you can click on that and see what else we have offered and what else we have scheduled over the coming months. Um, we do uh, love the webinars as a way to really connect with our audience and, and get, a, get a sense of where people are at in the chat and in the Q&A. Um, so really happy and hoping to see some people, some people again. Um, there is a question about whether or not the resources that have been shared in the chat box could be shared with attendees. Um, the, with the exception of the paper that, uh, the link to the paper that Sarah shared, all of these will be linked in the slides that'll get posted uh, within a couple of days of this presentation. Um, if you would like a link to that, uh, to that paper, feel free to email us at uh, nccmtmfaster.ca. Um, otherwise, all of the resources that were posted will be in those slides um, that do get posted online. Um, our website is there. There will be links uh, there to our, um, to our slide share where you can find all of our slides. Um, great. Just checking. Um, great. Looks like we've had, uh, yeah, just another comment here. So that's great. I'm going to pass it back to uh, Dr. Neil Stramko, Dr. Dobbins for some closing remarks. But thank you so much to our presenters. Uh, thank you so much to our audience for a really engaging session today. Yeah, I just echo Emily's uh, comments. Thanks so much, everyone, and sticking around over time and lots of great conversation. And a few of you who uh, noted an interest in collaborating, we look forward to hearing from you. Yes, and uh, thanks again, everyone, for joining. And thank you to uh, Sarah and Emily and Isabel uh, working behind the scenes who you didn't see. This really is um, just just like the, the rapid reviews, the webinar is a team effort as well. Um, so uh, thank you to everyone for all your work. And uh, wherever you're joining us from, I hope you have a great rest of the day.